so far and um, yeah I welcome Dr John Travis. So I'm going to be talking today about the dangers and the disasters that face the North Devon fishermen between roughly 1500 and 1910 and I'll be telling you uh, for instance, about the dangers that the fishermen who, even in the 16th century, were going right across to Newfoundland uh, after cod. They not only had to navigate the North Atlantic, when they got there, they were attacked by both the American Indians and by the French. And then they were coming all the way back uh, to the Mediterranean to sell their cod there. But I'll also be telling you about the herring fishing that went on all the way along the North Devon coast. And I'll be telling you how there were years of great plenty when the people didn't know what to do with the herring, there were so many. And fortunes were made, but just as suddenly the herring would disappear and then the people who'd grown to depend on the herring would face uh, great hardship. Next. So let's first of all talk about the herring. And as you can see here, there are two really important things about herring. First of all, they were surface shoaling. And in good years, they could be caught in massive quantities. But the other thing that made them special was the fact that you could preserve them, you could keep them. And you could do that either by soaking them in brine or by first salting them and then smoking them. Next. So um, I found this quotation that really highlights the problem with the herring. Now, the man who wrote this, um, Robert Southey, had been stopping in Lynmouth. And Lynmouth <coughs> was just springing up as a seaside resort. And it had also had massive shoals of herring, but they suddenly disappeared. So what he wrote was, in there, he's talking about the herring and the visitors, but he starts by talking about the visitors. He says, in their haunts, however, these visitors are capricious. They frequent a coast some seasons in succession, like herring, and then desert it for some other, with as little apparent motive as the fish have for varying their track. Next. So herring became really important on the North Devon coast. There hadn't been any herring at all, and suddenly there were huge shoals. And Daniel Defoe visited North Devon in the years between 1724 to 27, and he wrote, the chief business on this shore is the herring fishing. The herring about October come driving up the Seven Sea and from the coasts of Ireland in prodigious shoals. And bent beat, sorry, I'm looking at it with a difficult angle. <laughs> Do you mind if I occasionally? <laughs> and beat all upon this coast as high as Biddyford and Barnstaple. These spellings aren't mine, they're the spellings. <laughs> and that, that's all the way through the talk, by the way. <coughs> I'll be using the spellings on the documents and books I refer to. So Barnstaple, Biddyford in Devonshire, and are caught in great quantities by the fishermen. Next. So the shoals, this is an old map, 
were coming up and fishermen from Clavelli, which isn't shown, were catching them. From Here's the Tor and Torridge Estuary, Biddyford, Appledore, which isn't shown, Barnstaple, Ilfracombe, Coombe Martin, and just off the map, Lynmouth. They were all involved in catching herring. Next. So Lynmouth had a very large herring fishery. Um, this person, Tristan Risdon, is writing even earlier, 1632, and he says, Lynmouth of late years, notable for the marvellous plenty of herrings there taken. A kind of fish which in our forefathers' days kept, as it were, their station about Norway. But in our time, not without divine providence, take their course round about this Isle of Great Britain by shoals in great number. And from September until Christ died, offer themselves to the fishermen's nets to the no little benefit of this land. Next. So here's Lynmouth. Now Lynmouth, before the uh, herring fishing arrived, <coughs> had only been a very small collection of cottages, and the people must have lived uh, with, with very little money, very little income. And suddenly, they had this explosive uh, growth of the, of the uh, community because they suddenly had great prosperity. Next. And we, the reason I'm putting this on is because we actually know when the herring fishing started in Lynmouth, we've got a date, 1583, and if it started then in Lynmouth, it must have started at the other places along the coast. And the reason we know that is there was a church court case and an old man testified that the herring first arrived at Lynmouth in 1583 and was at once, he said, a very considerable fishery. And the court case also showed it wasn't just Lynmouth men who were fishing. They were coming to Lynmouth from the whole length of the Bristol Channel. So there were men from Minehead, <coughs> Northern, well, it would have been in the parish of Northern, but from Appledore, and they were renting cottages for the three-month season. And in this particular case, it was reported that six Northern men, Appledore men, alone took over 1,200 mazes of herring, a, a maze was a barrel with approximately 629 herring in it. So that's a massive quantity. It was valued at approximately 200 pounds, almost a fortune then. Next. So uh, there was another church court case at Lynmouth. You have to put bits, when you're doing research as I've done, you have to pick up fragments of information where you can find them. And I found this church case where it said that during the herring season, a clergyman read divine service at the mouth of the river Len, Lynn just for the herring fishermen. So there must have been a lot of fishermen to make that necessary. And he had a morning service on one side of the river and an evening service on the other side of the river. And so we know that if they were doing that, there must have been a lot of fishermen there to warrant having two uh, services a day. Next. Now, you may be wondering why herring fishing was so important at Lynmouth. Well, the reason was that at Lynmouth and further up the Bristol Channel, there were what were called weirs. Weirs were, you can still see them, if you go on the beach at Lynmouth, Porlock Weir, Minehead, watch it, 
and all the way up the coast, you can still see the remains of these walls that surrounded pools. Next. And here is the only picture I've actually found of one of these weirs. Weirs were like huge fish traps. You can see a fence which would have been on top of the wall. So when the shoal of herring came in, a huge shoal would go up the channel with the tide, a lot would go behind the fence, and when the tide went out, they'd be trapped. So the fishermen at Lynmouth and further up the channel, some of the fish would have been caught from boats, but a lot were caught the easy way in the weirs. Next. And if you go to Lynmouth today, you can also see, if you go down to the harbour and look at the river, you can see another of these fish traps which actually was, went on to be used for salmon. And it was used up to the year 2000. So salmon that were going to come up the river would get trapped uh, in the pool there when the tide went out. <coughs> and here is a close-up taken on the beach at Lynmouth showing the fencing on top of the wall of the weir. Next. Now, there was a problem. I was telling you that um, they had these uh, church services for the fishermen. That was the good side of it. But what the fishermen didn't like was that the same vicars were also charging tithes on all the fish that was caught. And um, Thomas Westcote, in 1630, he wrote, Lynmouth is only a little inlet, which in these last times, God has plentifully stored with herrings, which shunning their ancient places of repair in Ireland, come hither abundantly in shoals, offering themselves, as I may say, to the fishers' nets, until the parson taxed the poor fishermen for extraordinary, unusual tithes. And then, as the inhabitants report, the fish suddenly clean left the coast, <laughs> unwilling, as it may be supposed, by losing their lives to cause contention. <laughs> Next. Now here's another place where great numbers of herring were caught. Clavelli. Next. And here, uh, there was also a church court case which tells us quite a lot about the herring fishing there. So this is a man called Francis Randall, a mariner, 1726, and he gave evidence in a court case relating to the non-payment of tithes at Clavelli. The vicar there had become annoyed because some people were refusing to pay tithes. <clears throat> and this mariner said, there has long been a usage or custom within the parish for paying tithes to the rector of the said parish for all herrings caught in the sea and landed at the quay, that's their spelling, of Clavelli. Out of every 20 shillings produced in money or fish, one shilling was due to be paid to the rector. Next. And he goes on to say that usually for a season, there's employed in the herring fishery of, of Clavelli between 30 and 40 boats. And he goes on to say that the rector there, every Monday morning, in every week during the fishing season, in some house near the quay of Clavelli, um, gives a service and also a very long and particular form of prayers for the safety and prosperity of the fishermen. So the rector would be saying at Lynmouth and at Clavelli, well, I take these special services, I need uh, to charge you a tithe. 
Next. But as elsewhere along the coast, the prosperity depended on the herring shoals. And look what this vicar at Clavelli wrote. He said, in the year 1740, God was pleased to send us his blessing of a great fishery amongst us after a failure of many years. So there had been lots of herring. They'd suddenly disappeared. 1740, they came back again. This, through his mercy, continued in 1741. In the year 1742, the fish was small and poor and in less quantities in the year 1743. But an indifferent fishing in the year 1744, worse than in the preceding year, in the year 1745, still worse in the year 1746. So gradually the herring were disappearing again. Next. So, uh, Here's a picture taken, drawn by the Reverend John Sweet, who visited um, Ilfracombe twice, 1789 and 1796. Next. And he talks there about the fact that the herring had gone missing for 40 years and then come back again. So he visited in 1789 and he says... Within a few years, indeed, another article of commerce has been revived, revived, which for the space of 40 years had been unaccountably disused. I allude to the capture and seasoning of herring, which at periodical times are here taken in vast quantities. And then he talks about how they were cured. There are two ways of curing them. One by a common pickle of salt and the second by salting and smoking. These latter, that's the ones that are cured by putting salt on them and then smoking them, from their colour are called red herrings. The former, which are white, are pressed as close as possible in the barrel and are sold from 15 shillings to 24 shillings per barrel. But the latter, that's the ones that have been smoked, though less in number, have produced the sum of 50 shillings. So you have white herrings, which are salted, um, soaked in salt, put in barrels, and then you have the red herrings, which are smoked. Next. And this same Reverend John Sweet uh, visited Clavelli, and here's a picture he painted of Clavelli. Next. When he was at Clavelli, he happened to be there when a special occasion occurred. And he says, I now return to the quay. Suddenly a cry was heard. There, there was a great bustle, and presently a great shout reached us. A boy running from a boat with somewhat, he means something, as we'd say today, in his hands, commuted the agreeable infection to all whom he met, who testified also their loud joy, their joy in loud exultations. On his arrival at the quay, when the first clamours of my neighbours, who had also caught the wildfire, had abated, I ventured to inquire after the course of such sudden and general transport. Sir, says one, the herrings are on the coast. Several have now been taken in the nets. These are the first we've taken this year. And I suppose you know that Cavell is famous for its herrings. So the people were absolutely ecstatic because the herring had come back. And from year to year, they never knew if they would. What happens, we think, we don't know for sure. There would never been any herring before the end of the 16th century on the North Devon coast. And suddenly these massive 
shows appeared. Some years they came, some they didn't. Now, what we think was causing this was that in years when the sea was a bit colder, maybe it was a poor summer, maybe the Gulf Stream didn't come quite so far up the English coast, but in those cool years, the salmon, sorry, the herring, which fed on the plankton, came down further. But in the warmer sea years, they didn't come as far south. So that's probably the reason why you have plenty and then nothing. Next. So here's a picture of Appledore, <coughs> and you can see the herring boats coming in, and there are women here, um, and the women are taking the herring. I can't be sure what this is. I suspect that they may have cured the smoked, probably, the herring inside this building. But I put the picture on because it wasn't just the men folks who were involved in herring fishing, the women also, they, they were gutting the herring. Uh, they'd be putting, um, pegging the herring out before they were smoked. Next. So just a word now about Coombe Martin. I will come back to Coombe Martin a bit later. But Coombe Martin doesn't seem to have played a big, such a big role in the herring fishing. It seems to me, from the very little evidence that we can find about Coon Martin, or at least that I've been able to find, certainly herring were caught at Coon Martin, but it was caught for the local people to use. So the herring that would, were brought in on the boats would have been cured, most probably mainly salted in cellars, and kept for the winter time, but they don't seem to have been catching the massive <coughs> quantities like Lynmouth and Clavelli particularly were. So um, here you can see Daniel Defoe saying, at present it has only a cove for boats, but is very capable of being improved. Next. And here's another picture of Clavelli, uh, sorry, of Coombe Martin. This is probably an old lime kiln. I've done a bit of work on the lime industry on the Bristol Channel. I know that lime came across to Coombe Martin. But it's also possible that at different times this was used to smoke the herring that came in. Next. I'll say a bit more about Coo Martin later. I've put this in, you can't possibly read it from where you sit, um, but just to show you the type of documents that I'm finding my information from. So this letter was from the Ilfracombe Customs Collector to the Customs Board, the headquarters, and <coughs> it's 1789, um, 31st of October, 1789. Next. And here, uh, they're saying that this man, who's a fish curer in Ilfracombe, has hired a big sailing vessel and he purchases and cures fish in the Bristol Channel. So what he does is he goes out into the Bristol Channel, he meets small, small fishing boats, buys the herring they've caught, he cures them on his boat, salts them, and he's obviously claiming a bounty that's only paid to these large boats of 20 shillings per tonne. And so the customs collector is saying, is he entitled to claim that um, when he hasn't caught it? Next. 
So here's a picture of Ilfracoom, where that boat was based that was going out and meeting the small fishing boats. Next. And here's another document, again from the Ilfracoom Customs Collector in the following year. Now the bounties changed from year to year. And in the following year, there was a small <coughs> bounty for the small fishing boats. Next. I ought to explain to you, the government gave these bounties to encourage the fishermen. And the reason they encouraged the fishermen is they knew that fishermen made good sailors. And when there was a war, these fishermen would be the first to be called up to join the Navy. So they gave the bounties to help the fishermen who then uh, could become sailors. But what I'd like to point out, that here it's saying it's necessary <coughs> to observe that quantities of herrings are taken in the weirs within the limits of this port. Lynmouth was in the limits of Ilfracoon port. Therefore, the fish curers should be obliged to keep separate account of the herrings, which are taken by boats from those taken in the weirs. Because the fishermen were claiming a bounty for all the fish, but they shouldn't have been claiming it for the fish caught in the weirs. Next. And he goes on to describe how quite a few big vessels are based uh, at Ilfracoom or uh, at Watersmouth or at Porlock Weir and they're catching large quantities of herring. Next. Now here's a shock, or at least it came as a shock to me when I realised this. So you're probably wondering why I'm showing you a sugar plantation in the West Indies. And the reason is that most of the white herrings, the herrings that were put in barrels that had been soaked in brine, most of them were going to Bristol and being sent across to the West Indies and they were being used to feed the Negro slaves there. Because the barrels of herring could be kept <coughs> for months, for years, until they were needed. It was cheap, it was nutritious. Next. So, um, I'm pointing out here that the herrings are being sent to Bristol and they used to feed the uh, slaves. So, indirectly, the North Devon herring fishing industry was helping the people who ran the plantations because it was giving them food that could be kept all the year till it was needed. And it was cheap. Next. <coughs> Here's an advert um, uh, in Jamaica. Um, it's just advertising some of the herring that have been brought across. Right, let's talk about some of the uh, problems for the herring fishermen. Here's one. Lynmouth, 1607, there was what we probably think today was a tsunami. And a huge uh, tidal wave went up the Bristol Channel and it practically wiped Lynmouth out. Next. So here's Lynmouth, a prospering fishing village. They've had a tsunami. They get over that. Next. And then they have a flood disaster, but it's not the 1952 one, this is the 1771. But it was just as serious because uh, huge uh, masses of rock, several tons each, came down, choked up the harbour. Next. And uh, the fishermen are saying that uh, they'll be ruined unless the uh, 
the key is repaired. Next. And here's the key. Um, this is the sea wall. It's been damaged by the flood and unless it's repaired, there'll be no shelter for the fishing boats. Next. Now, the, the herring had been there, massive quantities, and this is a really fascinating piece because it tells us about the disappearance. So I found this in the guidebook for Lynmouth, and it <coughs> said, Lynmouth originally was a small village consisting entirely of huts and drying houses, drying of the herring. The inhabitants depending on the curing of herring. The shoals of these fish then frequenting the shore from the beginning of September to the end of October were occasionally so abundant that tons of them were thrown away or used as manure. <coughs> Indeed, the peasantry ascribed the desertion of, of the coast, it means from the coast, in 1797 to the insult offered to the fish by using them as manure on the field whereon now stands the house of Mr. Rowe at East Lynmouth. Next. And then he says, the period from 1787 to 1797 was the last occasion after an absence of exactly 40 years of the herring being caught here in sufficient quantities to form a trade. They were chiefly sent to Bristol for export to the West India Islands. During these 10 years, from September to the end of October, the sea at Lynmouth was literally one mass of herrings. With the exception of one abundant shoal in 1823, and listen to this, one previously on Christian, Christmas Day 1811, when the inhabitants were called out of the church to take them out of the weirs, out of the weirs, they have not been caught in any quantity since 1797. So you had these years of plenty, and then suddenly the herring disappear. Next. Here's Lynmouth, the manor green, where the Lord of the Manor had his fields, just off that picture. They used to even use the herring as manure on the fields. Next. Now, there was another huge danger for the herring fishermen, and that was the terrible storms that suddenly uh, blew up out of nothing. And this is 1821. I found a report in a paper, and it talks about a sudden gale of wind on the evening of Thursday Senite, fortnight, 40 boats out of 60 employed in the Cavelli herring fishery were lost among the rocks and 31 fishermen and pilots were drowned, leaving 19 widows and, and thank you, 61 children destitute of their only means of support. It wasn't a big village. That must have been a terrible disaster. Next. So here's Clavelli, small fishing port. Next. And here's another report of this disaster. And that wasn't all. That wasn't the only disaster. That was 1821. Next. 1838, another storm. A most distressing and heart-rending affliction has again occurred at this place. About 12 on Sunday night, after several hours' rain, it came on to blow a tremendous hurricane. Chimney tots, sorry, tiles, slates, etc. being scattered in all directions. The shipping in the harbour fortunately escaped injury, but melancholy to relate, the herring fishery has been most distressingly suffered. The boats were nearly all out, and sains set, the nets were set. 
11 of which are lost, 11 boats, and 26 men drowned. The distress among the wives, children, and relatives of the unfortunate sufferers is beyond description. Next. But they were also having these years when the herring failed to disappear at all. So they were facing economic blows as well. Next. So here's Clavelli, had been prosperous, it has storms, it suddenly loses its herring shoals. Next. The rector of Clavelli took pity on the fishermen and stopped demanding tithes. This, by the way, was the father of Charles Kingsley. He was the rector at Clavelli. Next. Very occasionally, you get newspaper reports of the herring coming back in big numbers. Next. Here's Ilfacombe, 1890 or thereabouts. And occasionally in the local papers, next, you find reports of large numbers of herring appearing at Ilfracombe and at Clavelli. Now, it wasn't only that the people could make money when they caught herring, they salted the herring down for the winter months. So if they didn't salt the herring down, then their main food for the winter just wasn't there. Next. Here's a photograph, about 1890, of a large catch of herring. All the boats, these small boats at Clavelli, packed with herring. Next. <coughs> so it's saying here, 1885, that herring was still the main uh, support in the winter. Next. Well, here I've looked and looked for reports of Coombe Martin. The first one I found in a newspaper for the fishing industry, now obviously the herring fishing was going on here, but it couldn't have been big enough to be reported on because this, 1898, I found the herring fishing this season has proved rather a failure. No large quantities, as in former years, have been uh, caught so far. But it is hoped the end of the season will prove more fertile. Next. So here's Coombe Martin, um, 1890 or thereabouts. There obviously still quite a number of sailing boats in the harbour. I'm at an angle, Grim, but you can see these pictures there, Kate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 1899. There have been some fine catches of herring here, and the fish are at present selling from 36 to 38 uh, for one shilling. That was really cheap for herring. <laughs> Next. Um, but we get an idea of uh, the size of the catch at Herring at Coombe Martin when it says, this is um, 1902, Herring fishing is now in progress. Mr. N. Parkin caught about three quarters of a maze. Um, so the roughly about 619, 620 Herring in a barrel. He's caught three quarters of a maze. That's the best catch for the season. When you think that uh, in the past, at places like Clavelli and Lynmouth, hundreds and hundreds of maize were being caught, it gives you an idea of the scale. Next. Now, just a tiny bit about oysters. You may not realise that on the coast between Lynmouth and along to Porlock, oysters were caught. Small boats went out dredging for them. And this uh, 
Richard Warner, he was a vicar who came to Lynmouth 1800 and he says, Lynmouth oysters which here sell for two shillings per hundred are shipped for other places. Next. There were also <coughs> the uh, fishing boats from Lynmouth were going over to Porlock to catch oysters. Next. And here's a picture showing the oysters being caught off Porlock Weir. That went on till about 1890. And then another disaster, the oyster fishermen from Colchester came in a fleet to the North Devon coast and dredged all the coast between Lynmouth and Porlock and scooped up all the oysters and suddenly nearly all of them were gone, destroyed the industry. Next. You may be interested to hear that 2015 they started to put oysters back in the sea or on the beaches uh, below the low tide mark uh, again to try and get the industry going. Next. Um, salmon. Salmon were caught in the Tor and Torridge estuary in huge numbers. Next. <clears throat> so much so um, that it's saying, um, as we antici anticipated, a large quantity has been taken. This is 1865. One boat caught 286 pounds of fish last week. This was using nets. Um, so the fishermen could make large sums of money. Next. Um, so these are on the Torridge. This is about 1900. They use small boats. They go out with nets. They catch the salmon. Next. But there are problems because the salmon fishermen who fish with rods try to get laws to prevent fishing with a seine. A seine is a net. And there's a constant battle. There are lots of court cases all through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Now, next. So Appledore, which was the main place <coughs> that the uh, salmon netters were operating from, suffered because the fishermen who were fishing with rods kept obstructing them. Next. And uh, here's another report of uh, one of the court cases. Next. But it still went on at a lower level. So these fishermen are netsmen at Appledore round about 1960. But it's diminished still more since then. So now there's only one, going to be one net allowed. And in 2013, there were only 53 salmon caught by netsmen and 59 by rodsmen. So it had been a big industry. It declined to almost nothing. Next. <coughs> right, completely different topic. Cod. A cod again could be caught in huge numbers and it was easy to preserve. Next. The man who started the cod fishing at Newfoundland was this explorer, John Cabot. Next. Who um, went all the way from Bristol across to North America and discovered Newfoundland, or Newfoundland. Next. And just after he got back, an ambassador uh, from Milan wrote to the Duke of Milan, 1497, and he'd been talking to some of the men 
who'd been on the voyage, and this is what he wrote. They affirm that that sea is covered with fishes which are caught not only with the net but within, with baskets, a stone being tied to the baskets in order that they may sink in the water. They were so plentiful that you could drop baskets in the sea and pull up cod. Next. So here's an early map of Newfoundland, Terra Nova. Next. Now, in the very, in the 16th century, not long after Cabot had gone there, um, fishermen from Barnstaple, next, and from Biddeford, it's quite amazing really, started in small sailing ships to go right across the North Atlantic, next. And they were going to Newfoundland. Now, fishermen were going from other parts of Devon too. The fishermen from Barnstable and Biddeford went to this bit in the southeast of Newfoundland. It was called Ferryland. Here's a map of this big bay. Here's Ferryland. And this is where they fished for cod. And after a while, they began to run up a few houses and a few of the Bonstable and Biddyford and Appledore fishermen would stop there through the year. Next. But there were two really big problems. One of them were the American Indians, the native people who lived there. So when the first visitors arrived from England, they tried to be friendly with the Indians. Um, but they found they had problems next. Because the American Indians resented these incomers. And from time to time, the American Indians attacked the fishing bases, attacked the houses, set fire to them, scalped the, the people, the fishermen, and their wives and families who were over there. Next, there was another big problem. The French were also fishing off Newfoundland, and they regarded Newfoundland as French, not English. And in 1696, they sent a small fleet. Here's one of the French vessels. They shelled Ferryland. They landed, they set fire with the help of Indians to the settlement. Next. And they drove all the uh, settlers and fishermen out. And these fishermen, the winter of 1696, had to come back to Appledore. And I found this petition and <coughs> The petitions from John Clapp and others of the constant inhabitants of Ferryland in Newfoundland now residing in Appledore in the port of Barnstaple that on Monday the 21st of September last, 1696, seven French ships of war and some fire ships landed about 700 men in Ferryland and attacked us on every side and after what resistance we could make against them, they being too many in number and too strong for us, we were forced to submit. The said enemy burnt all our houses, household goods, fish, oil, train vats, storage, stages, boats, nets, and all our fishing craft. Next. And then the petition goes on. Um, we humbly implore your most sacred majesty that a sufficient number of frigates and land forces be sent that this next season for fishing may not be lost and to regain and defend the same harbour and possessed of our places for rebuilding our houses and stages. 
So they hadn't been put off. They seemed prepared to take far bigger risks than most of us would today. They were prepared to go back to Newfoundland and fish again, but only if the Navy went to protect them against both the French and the Indians. Next. So here's Appledore, where the fishermen had come back to <coughs> winter of 1696. <coughs> Next. Found another petition, January 1706, and it says <coughs> that for many years past, your petitioners have sent from this port, this is from Biddyford, listen to this, 40 to 50 ships yearly, that's from Biddyford alone, on a fishing village voyage to Ferryland and the parts adjacent. B look at this, bringing up thereby a numerous company of seamen for the Queen's service to the great benefit of the country. So these petitioners are saying, our fishermen who are going across to Newfoundland are becoming so skillful as sailors they're going to benefit your navy. And since Ferryland has often been insulted by the French and Indians, who no less than three times in the last year burnt and destroyed all they could carry away from thence, so that if your petitioners, having no fort, should also be void of the man of war to protect our fishery during the fishing season in the country, your petitioners will be most certainly ruined. Next. Well, that obviously happened because in this petition the following year, the petitioners are thanking the government for say, sending a British naval vessel to protect them and asking the same thing be done again. So huge risks they were taking. Next. Now I wanted to find where the ports, uh, where the fishermen uh, traded to and I had a problem because when I looked at the port books to find what goods were being brought back from Newfoundland, I expected at first to see a lot of cod was coming back, dried cod. I didn't find hardly any. I realised after a while that was because the boats that were going to Newfoundland weren't coming back here with cod, they were going to France and Spain with the cod. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. What they were bringing back was train oil. Train oil is cod liver oil and they were using that uh, for things like lamps and lubrication. It was valuable. Next. So here's Barnstaple. The fishing boats were coming back there and to Biddyford. Next. Um, but trade was dis disrupted by wars with France and Spain. Next. And then I looked at the pattern of trade. And I'm putting here it was the custom for the Barnstaple and Biddyford boats to sail for Newfoundland with the first east winds of March, taking out salt from La Rochelle in France. After a season fishing on the Newfoundland coast, they returned in August and traded their dried cod along the coast of France and Spain before returning to the West Country port with a cargo of wine, dried fruit or salt. In 1827, one vessel, um, oh, sorry, three Bonstable ships were coming back from Newfoundland and they'd gone right down to Cadiz trading there. And there was a famine in Cadiz and they sold their cod, dried cod, for a fortune there. I marvel at these fishermen, they're right across to Newfoundland, back to France, Portugal, Spain, and then back here with things like fruit, wine, cork, salt, they'd bought over there. Next. 
Here's Cadiz then. And they went right across to Cadiz. Next. And I found details, 1678, of some of the boats from Barnstable and records of where they were going to. Robert Fishley, ship Leander Bag. These are the spellings in the document. It just says bound for a market. We don't know where they were going. The next one, it said bound for straits. And I'm not sure where that straits is, unless it's um, the Gibraltar Straits area, perhaps. But then another boat, the Pearl, bound for Rochelle. That will be La Rochelle. Another boat bound for St. Sebastian in North Spain. Another boat bound for Bilbao. Another boat bound for a market. So probably it would just go along the north, the coast of France and Spain till it sold its cod. Next. I also found another interesting thing. Um, this table here, 1675, shows each port in Devon how many fishing boats went to Newfoundland. So there were only four from Barnstable in that year, 23 from Biddyford. The only port in Devon that sent more was Dartmouth. From Devon alone, 72 fishing boats went in that year, when there were only 104 for the whole of England. But there were also some sack boats that went. Now, sack boats were bigger boats. They were trading boats. They would buy some of the fish off the fishing boats and come back as soon as they'd bought a cargo. So they would perhaps go out there twice in the season, whereas the fishing boats would fish all the season and then come back. Next. Now let's just talk about how they caught the cod. When they got out to Newfoundland, they'd use small boats, they used lines to catch the fish. Next. Then they'd bring the fish ashore and they had platforms where the cod was laid out to dry. Next. Here's a better picture. You can see the cod being lined out laid out on platforms. It was dried. If it was wet weather, it would be dried inside. Um, so the fish, the cod was being brought here, it was being dried, and then it was taken back as dried cod. Next. Here's another picture. Um, again, you can see the cod uh, being laid out and a shelter where it could also be laid out. Next. Um, eventually, small settlements grew up along the coast and the descendants of lots of Barnstable, Biddyford, Appledore men uh, still live in Newfoundland today. Next. Now, I think this picture's probably actually in Brittany, but I put it in because it tells us a lot. Round about March, fishermen from France as well as from North Devon were going across to Newfoundland and the families who saw them go would never know if they were going to come back again. They got all these dangers to face. They were gone for the whole summer. It was a huge adventure, but a hu huge danger. Um, yeah, so it's the next one. So, sadly, the cod industry at Newfoundland suddenly declined in the 19th century. It was partly there was growing demand, was partly their techniques of catching the fish improved. And so, from about 1800, the number of boats going from North Devon went down year on year. Next. In 1837, there was an attempt to try and revive the trade. And it said, an establishment is formed in Biddyford for the sale of Newfoundland fish. 
So they made an attempt to restart the trade next, but they had two big problems. One of the problems it talks about here is there's nothing like the same number of fish to be caught. But also it's talking about the duty on Newfoundland fish in Portugal amounts to nearly a prohibition of any being sent thither. So it was getting harder and harder to catch the fish and less and less profitable to do it. So this was the last reference I found to cod fishing in North Devon. And I think by the end of 1838, it had come to an end. Next. So this is my last slide. And I put it in to try and sum up a lot. So these are Clavelli fishermen. It's 1890. These would have been herring fishing men. There was still some herring there then. But as elsewhere in North Devon, the great years, fishing years, were at an end. Um, there's still today some fishing on the North Devon coast. There's still a few fish, herring fishermen, for instance, at Clavelli. There's quite a big cod industry, sorry, quite a big fishing industry in the Bristol Channel, mainly catching ray. And those ray are brought back to uh, Appledore. There are also some crabs and lobsters, for instance, caught at Ilfracombe. But the great days are at an end, and these men, their faces tell a lot. They've experienced hardship, occasional good years. They're self-resilient men. I think today, if you go to places along the North Devon coast, most of the people like this would be people who took other visitors out on boat trips and did a little bit of fishing. But they're no longer the same sort of people that used to experience such dangers and such hazards in the time I've been talking about. Right, thank you.